Hey everyone, this is Nick and I chose to postpone cleaning up my whole apartment just so I could bring you the best Linux and open source news. And no, it has nothing to do with laziness, absolutely not. This time we have some interesting details about Google's Linux distribution that they run on their own desktops called G-Linux. We have details on Asahi Linux now running on M2 Max and also improving a lot the experience for M1 Max as well. And we have a new GNOME extension that will pretty much give you the material you experience from Android, but on GNOME. Among a ton of other things, of course. So let's get started right after I tell you how you can get $100 of free credit to get started on your own Linux or gaming server. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use. They are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games, like Pi-hole. Pi-hole is a DNS sinkhole that filters out requests to add serving domains. Basically, it lets you block ads and improve network performance. It lets you actively monitor every DNS request made on your network and block requests as they come in. And you can deploy it in one click on Linode so you can ensure I stay poor. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. Did you know that Google has had their own Linux desktop distro for a while? Before 2018, they used Gubuntu, something based obviously on Ubuntu. But since then, they moved to something called G-Linux, based on Debian. Why this move? Well, it seems like the LTS two-year releases from Ubuntu meant they had about 100,000 devices to upgrade each time. And it was too time-consuming. They only completed a migration in about a year, so they had to repeat the operation every other year to move from LTS to LTS. So this started a move to a rolling Debian testing distro called G-Linux to ensure all engineers would get the latest updates and patches without the need to wait for big LTS compilations of new stuff. They have their own workflow to update the distro called Sieve. This detects new Debian package versions starts building them inside of a package group, which contains every package that needs to be upgraded together, and once the group has been built, Sieve runs a test suite to make sure everything is still working nicely. And if all tests go well, all new packages are merged with the glinux package pool, and the new release is rolled out gradually. Unfortunately, neither glinux or Sieve are available for anyone outside of Google, although Google says that they will try and work closer with Upstream to share their internal patches. I think it's pretty interesting, if only because it means that the LTS release cycle, which was made specifically for companies, might not be a good fit for all companies. And this is probably something that most rolling release distros that also might want to expand to enterprise should work on. Some kind of workflow that lets companies build, test, do continuous integration, and the like, just to make sure that they can still use the latest releases of all packages, but have a comprehensive testing suite to make sure that everything runs fine. Something I missed last week, it looks like Latte Doc might not be developed anymore. Latte Doc is a super popular doc program for KDE. It's basically recommended to everyone who wants to transform their KDE desktop into macOS, and I used it myself back when I used KDE. The main developer has been working on Latte for the past six years, but nowadays they just lack time, motivation or interest in maintaining the program. Now this also blocks the release of Latte 0.11, since that would require someone to be available to support it and fix bugs. The existing version 0.10 was already pretty stable and it will still be available in all repos where it already lives, but if no one picks the project up, it might mean that over time, this program will go the way of the Dodo, which would be unfortunate. Latte Doc is a fantastic program for KDE. It's super lightweight, it's customizable, it's powerful, it really looks super nice, and it would be a shame to let it die. So I really hope that someone has the skills and the motivation to pick it back up and to keep development going. 
And now you can stop eyeing this new M2 MacBook Air with its new design, smaller bezels, new chip and, and thermal throttling. Again, seriously Apple. Anyways, you can now decide to use one and to use Linux, as Asahi Linux now runs on these devices, as well as on M1 Macs, of course. It already supports CPU frequency scaling, Wi-Fi, USB, the keyboard and touchpad, NVMe storage, battery status and controls, and more. They also added an open source driver for the GPU for M1 Macs, which means you can get a full featured experience on an M1 Mac and Linux. Oh, and the Mac Studio is also supported, as well as Bluetooth, although performance will be crappy if you use Bluetooth and 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi at the same time. Of course, since it's still early days, all that support is still fully experimental, and you will get issues here and there. But the experience still looks pretty nice already, to the point that Linus Torvalds already published the latest release of the Linux kernel from an M1 Mac. Yeah, if Torvalds uses it, then it's definitely ready and you can use it. Or maybe not, because we're not all Linus level geniuses. But still, this means that these devices are now accessible to be fully used with Linux, and it might be time I took a look at one. Now, speaking of the Linux kernel, version 5.19 has been released and it's a pretty big update. It focuses on core networking code for wireless and wired connections, with a lot of driver work being done on that area, from TCP, Wake on LAN, and more real tech devices support. The kernel also picked up ZSTD compression for firmware, which means that firmware will now use less space. And the kernel also fixes a battery drain issue on Intel laptops, from Skylake, or 6th gen, to Comet Lake, or 10th gen. The Direct Rendering Manager subsystem is also updated, bringing improvements to a lot of AMD GPUs and the Apple M1 NVMe controller and if uses drivers were also merged. The Hardware Monitor subsystem now has better sensor coverage across all motherboards. The recent ThinkPad Trackpoint 2 keyboard is now supported with proper function keys mapping, native scrolling and middle button support, and Wacom drivers were also improved. Big, big, big update that will definitely make Intel laptop owners very, very happy. Provided they have an Intel chip from the 6th gen to the 10th gen. Less idle battery drain is always a good thing. And of course, if you use a rolling release, you might already have had the update. And if you don't, you'll probably have to wait for the next version of your favorite distro. Linux Mint 21 Vanessa was released in its Cinnamon, Mate and XFC editions, just a few days after the first beta, taking me completely by surprise, which explains why I was so late with my video review. Still, this version isn't groundbreaking by any means, but it does update the internals to the Ubuntu 22.04 base, with more up-to-date repos and the kernel version 5.15. Cinnamon gets a heavily updated window manager, which is transparent for users, but should be more reliable, easier to upgrade, and should look nicer on all apps using title bars or header bars. The Cinnamon menu gains a few features, and the default apps gain more thumbnail support, better sticky notes, more careful time shift backup manager, a more powerful Bluetooth utility, and more. The XFC and Mate variants basically use the exact same desktop Mint 20.3 used, but still benefit from the updated internals and apps, so they're not left with nothing. Check out my video review of Linux Mint 21 by clicking somewhere up there in the corner. I concluded that it's still king for beginners, it's still the most complete and the most stable distro that you could probably ever use, but if they keep doing incremental upgrades and don't support the latest Linux technology in the next LTS, I'd say they're probably gonna fall way behind. GNOME developers have shared their traditional weekly update, this time porting the first run configuration wizard to GTK4 and libadvita. GNOME console, the new lightweight and simple default terminal for GNOME, has also received the same treatment, and WebKit GTK, the web engine that powers web views in GNOME and GNOME Web, or Epiphany, also got a new update, which fixes video playback in Yelp and also patches some security issues. GNOME Builder, the IDE for writing GNOME applications, is progressing nicely on its GTK4 port and not only makes its way to feature parity with the GTK3 version, but also gets some re-architecturing to prepare future changes. In terms of apps, podcasts get ported to GTK4, 
our note, a handwritten note-taking app gets a new icon, text input, the ability to import PDFs, screenshots can now be pasted in the app directly from the clipboard, and more. Carbird, the Twitter client, is also currently being ported to Libadvita. Bottles got a new update with a versioning system that lets you downgrade to a previous version of your bottles, and it also got automatic cover fetching for installed games. A lot of things are happening in the GNOME world, and the transition to Libadvita seems really popular with app developers, which means that in the end, GNOME might end up being the most cohesive desktop on the whole Linux desktop ecosystem, which is cool. But let's not forget about KDE though. This week, a bunch of 15 minute bugs were fixed in activities, discover, or the settings. And the overview effect can now be filtered just by typing. When you start typing in this view, it will only display windows that match what you're looking for on top of performing a K-Runner search. The digital clock widget also lets you customize the font size, typeface, and styling. And on Wayland, you can now adjust a graphic tablet's input area to match your screen's coordinates. Discover also got some love, warning you when you're looking at an app that's in beta, with another warning when the beta version is older than the stable one, to ensure that you don't install outdated software. Add-on pages in Discover won't display weird unclickable URLs anymore, and it will be more clear when a Flatpak remote is user-specific to differentiate from one that is applied to the whole system. And of course, there are a ton of bug fixes for Discover, the Plasma Wayland session, or KRunner. It's definitely good to see Discover being worked on, because while it works, it is very utilitarian. And it still needs, in my opinion, a nice UI refresh. But at least in terms of features, it is now pretty much caught up. If you like the new GNOME theme provided by Libadvita, but you wish it had accent colors or just a touch of personalization, you're going to love this new GNOME extension. Heavily inspired by the recent Material U system for Android, it lets you generate a new color palette for your Libadvita apps each time you change your desktop wallpaper. And for GDK3 applications, if you use the Libadvita GDK3 theme, you can also make them pick up the right colors, as well as with Flatpak apps if you enable theming permissions with Flatseal. It's not perfect just yet, as you need to manually refresh the colors once you changed wallpapers using a system indicator for the extension, and apps that are already open won't automatically get the new colors. You'll need to close and reopen them. Still, it's pretty interesting, and it would make a nice addition to the full upstream GNOME instead of living in an extension. I think that if GNOME had accent colors and a way to tint all the window colors with the accent color or the wallpaper color, basically people would be less inclined to be critical of the move to Libadvita. Now, this extension proves that Libadvita apps can be themed somewhat, and I just wish that GNOME would add this stuff natively out of the box. It's a small customization touch, it won't break the look and feel of applications, it's, I think it's just a good idea. And let's complete this video with what's new in the Linux gaming world. A lot, it turns out. First, the number of Linux gamers keeps rising and rising, now reaching 1.23% of Steam users, the highest it's ever been. This amounts to more than 1.6 million Linux gamers, and these are only the ones that take the Steam user survey, so you can expect the real number to be higher than that. The most used distro is still Ubuntu, with a total of 19% between 20.04 and 22.04, with Arch being second at 13.8%, Manjaro at 11.4%, and SteamOS already at 7.6%, climbing very fast. With that, a lot of new games are reaching the Steam Deck, passing the 4300 mark, this time including Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2, Commandos 2, LA Noir, Batman the Telltale series, and more. SteamOS 3.3 was also released with a bunch of cool updates. First, you can get to the achievements and guides from the in-game overlay. There's the ability to schedule night mode to reduce blue light after a certain hours. Firefox is now shipped as a flat pack in desktop mode to stay up to date. There's a new Plasma desktop theme inspired by the old Steam green and square look. The graphics driver has been updated with performance and compatibility fixes, and the Wi-Fi shouldn't disconnect from 5 GHz networks anymore. And finally, Wine 7.14 was released, making progress on the Syscall interface for user 32, which is the API that lets you interact with the lower-level processes of the Windows layer. 
It also improved font fallbacks in direct write, so stuff shouldn't be too garbled when a core Microsoft font isn't present on the system. And it fixes 19 bugs, including for Civilization 4, Unravel 2, World of Tanks, Roblox, or Total War Shogun 2. Tons of cool gaming stuff this week, and if you like Linux gaming, stay tuned because the next video on the channel on Saturday will be my long-term review with the Steam Deck. I've had it for 5 months, and I'm gonna take a look at how the hardware holds up, how the battery life holds up, how the gaming experience has improved or been decreased, and generally, just is it still a good device 5 months in, and is it future-proof? So yeah, subscribe if you want to see that, and if you're already subscribed, well, see you on Saturday. But I just can't let you leave without telling you about today's sponsor, Tuxedo. Tuxedo is a company that makes laptops and desktops, and they ship them with Linux out of the box. Although you can also grab a Windows license if you want, but that's really not the point of their devices. They ship a variety of popular Linux distributions, but if you want, you can just install your own, and if there are a few tweaks needed here and there, you can just add their repos or PPAs to add the good kernel versions and everything that you might need for the device to be perfect. They have a very, very wide range of devices, from the smallest Ultrabooks and NUX, to executive laptops, to mid-range Ultrabooks, to basically the biggest gaming towers or gaming laptops or workstations, anything you might want they have. And every device has a plethora of configuration options, from the CPU, the GPU, the storage, with hard drives or NVMe, you can add TVT drives or Blue Array drives on the towers if you want, and you can even engrave your own graphics design on the lid of the laptop or on the case of the desktop, which is really nice. So, if you need a new device and you want to make sure it runs really well with Linux, and if you want to buy it from a company that supports Linux development, like Tuxedo, well, head over to the link in the description below, click it, and get yourself a new Tuxedo desktop or laptop. They're really nice. Okay, so thanks everyone for watching the video. If you liked it, you know what to do. Like it, subscribe, turn on notifications, write a comment, whatever. Make it more popular. And if you didn't like the video, you can also help make it more popular by clicking the dislike button or leaving a comment to tell me why you didn't like it. And if you want to support the channel, you can also click on the super thanks button on the PayPal link in the description or join my Patreon subscribers and YouTube members because both get access to a weekly podcast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!